Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the pre-recorded lecture for class eight. This is the second lecture in the final topic that um, we have for my section of spatial practices. And this topic is called, what does space look like? Last week we uh, did a close reading of Jan Crick's text on axonometry and parallel projection. And this week we're going to be looking at perspective, linear perspective, vanishing points, um, the history and theory of these um, systems. And this will actually be the final pre-recorded lecture for the semester. After week eight, what we're gonna do is focus more on your individual assignments, your essays, your presentations, as well as how you're going to transform everything you've learned into a final creative project. So we'll switch to a, a more consultation workshop based uh, environment. Okay, so the agenda for this week. Um, in class, we're going to do our third and final close reading exercise. As a group, we're going to look at the uh, section one from a book called Perspective as Symbolic Form. Uh, this is a book by Erwin Panofsky, a very famous art historian. We're going to ask questions such as, what is the historical context of the invention of perspective and why is this important for Panofsky? Um, we're going to ask what Panofsky says about perspective and perception and why he calls perspective a symbolic form. Uh, we'll also have a chat about the presentation topics and essay questions and maybe look a little bit more at writing and phrasing and so on. And as usual, I'll try to make some time for Blender Show and Tell and troubleshooting. Okay, so for this week, um, back to the question of what does space looks, look like. The, the text at the center of this lecture is um, the book Perspective as Symbolic Form by Erwin Panofsky. Okay, so who was Erwin Panofsky? Uh, he was an art historian um, from the late 19th and mainly, really mainly early 20th century. He was a proponent of a type of reading of art called iconology. He encouraged a reading of art that sought to synthesize or bring together the detachment of Russian formalism, as in, you know, the, the physical characteristics of an artwork with historical materialism. And historical materialism is, you know, how can we read an artwork as a product of its time, basically. Um, Panofsky proposed three different levels of art historical meaning there would be the primary natural subject matter of an artwork, the secondary conventional subject matter, it's iconography, it's signs and symbols, and it's tertiary or intrinsic meaning. And this is where the historical uh, materialism comes in. You know, how, can a, how does a painting function as an artifact within society? How, does it, um, how is it used as a commodity that's traded? Who is it owned by? Um, all these sort of things. And if you're interested in this background to who Panofsky was, um, you can also read the introduction section to Perspective as Symbolic Form by Christopher Wood, which gives a really good example of the tensions between um, philosophy and philology that operate in the work of Panofsky. Or you can read his Wikipedia page. All these things you know, will help to give a background of who this uh, person was and why they might write a text like Perspective as Symbolic Form. Okay, so the context that, that Panofsky is writing about, he's looking at the moment in European painting when linear perspective um, becomes sort of, or, or arises out of um, various scientific and philosophical innovations, particularly um, in the Italian Renaissance. So if we look at the image on the right hand side, um, this image has uh, one point linear perspective. We can see in the center of the image, we, I believe we have um, Plato and Socrates, I think, in the School of Athens. This is meant to represent um, the, uh, the, the philosoph philosophers of the classical age. In the center of the image where we have um, uh, Socrates here, this is where the vanishing point is and all of the all of the lines in the architectural space point to this central vanishing point. But in this earlier image, uh, there is no vanishing point. There's no um, perspective. 
scientifically speaking. Instead, we have a, a way of looking at space that has many different viewpoints. We can sort of see different sides of buildings that we shouldn't really be able to see all at once. We can see behind the building. We can see, um, you know, the people are all different sizes. The space is not um, mathematically ordered here. It's more ordered in a narrative sense, you know. We're looking at different moments um, and different spaces. Where in the Raphael painting, we're seeing um, one moment unified by one single perspective system. And this development is what Panofsky is very interested in writing about. So, okay, so where did this development come from? So there's a quite a, a large number of people who contributed to um, the formal um, development of linear perspective. We might, first of all, okay, there's a typo there, that uh, obviously should say 1333. Um, it's rather than 1733. Um, Filippo Brunelleschi, uh, the Italian Renaissance architect, um, was one of the early pioneers of linear perspective. Uh, he used mirrors in his drawing to, um, to transfer what he was seeing onto a two-dimensional plane. And, okay, let's move on to our next uh, example. We had Leon, Leon Battista Alberti. Um, also from the early 15th century. Alberti wrote the text De Pittura, which is uh, a treatise or like a, an essay on painting, colour, form and perspective. And from these diagrams here, we can see that um, the, what I'll describe later in this essay, the basic principles of linear perspective, and particularly how do we calculate how much smaller things should get as they move further away from the viewer. These things have, have been quite specifically formalized. And in my diagrams later, you'll see that, you know, my diagrams are essentially exactly the same as Alberti's diagrams from uh, 600 years ago. Uh, then we have Albrecht Dürer. Albrecht Dürer was a German Renaissance artist and theorist. Um, in addition to being a very well-known artist, he wrote four books on measurement, um, instructions for measuring with the compass and ruler. And Dürer, like many theorists at the time, is highly influenced by Euclid and uh, classical Greek geometry. So in the Renaissance, you know, we have a, a strong re-engagement um, from uh, European artists and philosophers with the artists and philosophers of um, classical Greece. In this image here, by Dürer, Dürer is sort of explaining visually how linear perspective works. Uh, we have the artist has one eye closed, and with the other eye open, he uses this viewfinder to make sure that his head doesn't move. Uh, he has his page here where he's drawing the picture. On the page is a grid, and this grid matches the grid that he has put between himself and the world. And of course, it's interesting that the naked woman here represents the world, and the world is also represented by these windows. So these windows are performing a metaphorical function where Dura is comparing the, the flat screen of the perspective grid to the flat page, but also to the sort of square flat framing of the window. And this is where we get this um, notion of the painting as a window to the world. Um, and Dura is, is describing his perspective system here um, in a way by talking about flattening the world using um, these grid type systems. So what he'd do is he'd look, say, at the woman here and depending on, for example, where her eye appears when he looks through the grid, let's say her eye appears at this little um, cross intersection here, then he would draw it on the page at the same intersection. And the grid therefore becomes a way of flattening out the three-dimensional world onto a two-dimensional surface. This is something we've spoken about quite a few times already. And then, of course, we have René Descartes, the French philosopher, mathematician, and scientist. And Descartes helps to uh, develop analytical geometry, which um, also influenced the subsequent development of calculus by Isaac Newton and uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And what we're moving on to here is really, you know, a lot of the mathematical basis of what we do in Blender. 
It's the ability to, in what we call now a Cartesian grid space, where we have the x, the y, and the z axes, to calculate the relative position of uh, different parts of a shape. So with um, uh, Cartesian geometry and uh, analytical calculus, we can calculate the position of all of these different points if we know other things about the shapes, such as um, their relative uh, lengths of these sections or the angles between different lines. We can use uh, geometry and calculus to uh, calculate the form in three-dimensional space, which, as I've said before, this is really what Blender is doing every time we look at the screen. It's performing calculations of where all these points should be. So what we looked at last week, just to remind you, we looked at projection systems all on the left-hand side of this line here. Um, and what these projection systems do, what all of them do, is uh, have a series of rules that can tell a drawing system how to represent three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. So in the parallel projection systems, the common factor they all have is that um, lines on the same face or on the same um, uh, side of projection always remain parallel. All of them share this quality. Whereas in perspective projections, any time we have a plane moving away from the viewer, it always moves to, um, to a vanishing point. So therefore, the lines are not parallel. So in one point perspective, the front of the object faces a viewer, so therefore lines remain parallel, but the side of the object goes to a vanishing point, and the lines are no longer parallel. They are actually converging, as in going together. Two point perspective, neither face is facing the viewer, so therefore both sides of the object are converging um, to vanishing points, but the verticals are still parallel. And in three point perspective, we add a third vanishing point, and now even the vertical lines are converging. And in the reading, we're going to also talk about curvilinear um, projection. And this is a big point that, um, that Panofsky talks about. What Panofsky reminds us is that the, the surface inside our own eyeballs is not flat. In, in a camera, we have usually a flat sensing plate. In our eye, the retina is curved. And so actually, we never really actually see a straight line. All of the lines that we see are curved. And we can mimic this with a very wide angle lens. We'll see that straight lines sort of become curved. But in our brain, our brain is sort of telling us that all of these lines are straight, even though the primary input that our eyes receive is curved. And this is a big point that um, Panofsky wants to make, that there's a difference between the systems that our brain use to um, tell us what's happening in the world compared to actually what our body experiences, and in this case, what our eyes see. OK, so let's move on. I'm going to very quickly describe how all of these perspective systems work. And if you want to practice hand drawing yourself, these instructions will tell you how to use each perspective system. So one point perspective. We start by drawing a horizontal line with evenly marked spaces. Then we draw a horizon line uh, with a vanishing point. Vanishing point is usually in the middle. And then we have these things called distance points. And they're just sort of a, a functional point that we use to make certain calculations. Uh, first, we draw lines connecting um, the points marked on the baseline to the vanishing point. And then we locate where these distant points would connect to the baseline. And we start connecting these lines. And what that's going to do is it's going to divide up a grid on the ground that is moving away from us in space, but getting smaller at the correct rate. So as we join all these lines together, and then we use these intersections to make a grid, we have a grid that's perfectly sort of moving away from us, and it appears to sit kind of flat on the ground. And once we have this, we can use this grid, particularly to locate architectural objects. Um, and what you'll notice with most of these projection systems is that their speciality is architecture. You know, if you draw a person, often it's very hard to tell what type of um, spatial system you're using because there's no straight lines. Um, these projection systems are most obvious 
um, when drawing architectural spaces. Okay, so two-point perspective. This time we have two vanishing points. So again, we draw a horizon line with two vanishing points, and then we mark a red dot, or any dot, doesn't have to be red, um, where the, the grid on the ground is going to start. And um, we draw another line, another baseline, and we make some divisions again, but remembering that we had this central line here, and then we can start joining points from the, um, the, the central point that we marked from one vanishing point, and then doing the same from the other vanishing point. And now we have a grid where no object on that grid would ever be facing us. Any object would be moving away from us, going to both vanishing points. So if we started to draw architectural forms on this grid, we'd find that there's no um, square facing the viewer, that both the top and the bottom of, of any of these forms is now moving away from the viewer. And we can do cool things like, you know, if you know where an object sits, technically if we lowered this object, this cube would slot in here. But also you can see what I've done is I've moved this object above the horizon line. And so therefore we now see underneath the object rather than seeing on top because the horizon line represents the eye level of the viewer. So if we drew an object exactly on the horizon line, we would neither see the top nor the bottom. We would just see the two side faces. And we can use this grid to do a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, what this diagram is going to show is that if I wanted to draw a building like this and I wanted to divide up the spaces between these doors, um, the, what the Renaissance theorists were calculating is you know, what's the, not only the way that um, a grid would get smaller in space, but, you know, how do we divide up um, a rectangle in perspective? And we do all sorts of clever things where um, we can use the diagonals of the rectangle and where these diagonals intersect, that point actually represents halfway between here and here. Because if we cut this um, space in half by simply measuring the length of this line, it wouldn't make sense because this side should be larger seen from the viewer than this side. So that's why we use um, these geometrical divisions to um, give us these um, accurate calculations of how things should get smaller um, the further away from the viewer that they become. Okay, and finally, three-point perspective. We simply add another vanishing point, usually, to two-point perspective. So here I've just reproduced um, the grid that I made for my two-point perspective and I've added a vanishing point way higher than the um, horizon line. And what this does is that now, instead of our verticals being parallel, like if I go back here, all these vertical lines are still parallel, we start connecting the vertical lines to the high vanishing point so that if we want to draw a building, we have that kind of comic book style where, you know, if you're standing at the bottom of a tall building looking up, you really get that sense of three-point perspective. Or we can reverse the system and put the vanishing point below the grid, and we can create that sense of being up very high looking down. So this might be you know, something very familiar from like Batman or Spider-Man um, cartoons where jumping from building to building is often um, represented by exaggerating the height by using three-point perspective. Okay, so these are our basic um, uh, physical descriptions of how perspective systems work. And if I go back to the work of, let's say, um, Alberti, you know, this is the theory that's being worked out um, in the 15th century by Renaissance theorists. You can see that the same principles are being applied. Okay, so where was I up to here? Okay done our three-point perspective. And if you want to learn a little bit more about this, and particularly how it applies to um, Italian Renaissance painting, uh, there's a whole bunch of great stuff online. I'll post some of these links. The, these two links here are, are demonstrations on how to draw pers um, uh, in correct perspective yourself. And I'll post a link um, to this analysis here that shows how uh, all of these distances can be accurately calculated from this painting of Venice by Canaletto. Okay, so back to Panofsky's reading.
What Panofsky is interested in in his text is why does this particular type of spatial representation, why does this develop during the Italian Renaissance and what type of way of looking at the world does it reveal? For, Panofs for Panofsky, he doesn't want to look at any spatial system as, um, as being actually real or realistic or any more or less realistic than another system. What Panofsky thinks is that, you know, in every way, every drawing system is facing the problem of how do we convert our experience of the world onto a two-dimensional surface. Um, and we found that in scroll painting, often the use of parallel projection allowed a sense of time to extend along the length of the scroll, whereas in perspective, we had something that was really getting close to what a camera does, which is it grabs everything at once from one point of view. And so for Panofsky, these different types of spatial representation should be understood as different types of ways of looking at the world. And so um, Panofsky um, looks quite a lot at how these Renaissance theories um, flowed through uh, the development of the camera in the late 18th and 19th century and this idea of fixing the image permanently um, on, on the photographic surface. And I would also point to other theorists like um, Andre Bazin, um, who, who was writing about film and photography, um, where he, he, Bazin described the camera as really an automation of uh, Renaissance perspective, that the camera is the machine that is the result of this type of Renaissance thinking. And a lot of Renaissance artists, such as Leonardo da Vinci, also were using these type of devices, pre-camera devices, such as um, a camera, a camera lucida, which is where you look through a lens and that lens allows you to see um, the image projected on your paper. These types of pre-camera devices were very popular with Renaissance artists because the way that they were looking at the world was um, this all based in the same sort of perspe perspective type theories of not moving, having one eye closed, and seeing how these optical effects could could order the world around us and give a sense of logic to it. Um, and as an interesting side note, Bazin talks a lot about the moment when photography is invented, that um, we have this ability to have a machine that does all of Renaissance calculation for us, and in a way, the, the camera tries to remove the artist altogether. No longer does the artist have to calculate where all of these line intersections would be. The machine looks where it wants to look and automatically creates an image. Um, there are other theorists of photography who would say that what we have with the photograph, it's the first time we can consider um, something in the image that is not the result of human intention. For example, a tree in the background of a photograph I take might not have been my intention for that tree to be there. Whereas it would be impossible for us to say that if I made a painting and there was a tree in the background, that I accidentally put a tree in the background. It would make no sense. I would have to draw every tree. So um, for Bazin, the photograph represents um, the automation of the image and removing the human subject. Now, of course, a different interpretation would be by someone like Donna Haraway, who would say that um, well, that's, you know, we can never consider a photograph to be completely automatic because still it, de it is determined by who is pointing the camera and how they look. So for Donna Haraway, the gaze, the power to look, um, who takes a photograph of what is very not automatic and is very subjective. So, you know, the, the transition from um, perspective drawing to the camera introduces a lot of really interesting conversations about um, not only how we see the world and how the world is recorded, but who is doing the recording and, and so on. And one of the other interesting things that Bazin talks about in his essay on photography is that whilst on the one hand all of Renaissance perspective comes together and gives us the camera where the perspective is calculated perfectly, it doesn't give us reality. It gives us almost a second reality that is 
a whole strange world of its own. And Bazin points to early surrealist photography. So this is a photograph by Dora Ma, and, um, and in her image, she, by using the camera, she creates something that almost seems unreal. We don't know what this sort of monster is, but because it's a photograph, it challenges us even more because we, we think, how could this be real? So the world of the photograph actually, according to Bazin, sort of separates from our world and creates its own strange world of its own. And um, some other optical effects that we know that we get from photography, as we've described before, are things like the vertigo effect, where um, instead of the camera just being an objective uh, reality machine, we find the camera has its own properties that can create quite unreal and fantastical effects um, that don't require any computer-generated special effects, they're simply manipulating the, the physical sensor um, relationships of the camera. In this, in this case, the relationship between the zoom of the camera and the position of the camera. So the dolly zoom effect, um, famously used by uh, Ehrman Roberts, um, the cinematographer working with Alfred Hitchcock in the film Vertigo, um, the, the dolly zoom vertigo effect, I think reinforces this idea that the camera um, as a perspective machine also starts to create a strange alternate reality of its own. And what I've been trying to do with us in Blender so far is by understanding the spatial systems that Blender uses and their history from the relationship between orthographic spaces and scroll painting to the relationship between Renaissance perspective, the camera and these strange um, vertigo effects, we can remind ourselves that the representational system that we have in something like Blender contains a wonderful collection of all of these different histories and all of these different ways of seeing that in a way they all share the common um, problem of simply how do we represent the three-dimensional world around us in two dimensions and there are so many different answers to this question and they connect us to so many kind of fascinating um, artistic topics. Um, and I've just got another artist to introduce this week. This is Julie Maritu. Um, she was born in Ethiopia in 1970. And in Julie Maritu's drawings, if you look closely, you'll find a whole lot of really interesting sort of spatial experiments. In different points, we can see that there's a one-point perspective architectural drawing. And then there are these shapes that don't really seem to fit any space in particular. And it's almost as if we're entering like a spatial explosion um, rather than a really clear um, expression of a particular spatial system. If we look at the colour of the blue and the pink here, these shapes seem to be one-point perspective planes that sort of fit with these architectural elements here. But then, you know, some of these more calligraphic um, painterly lines um, they seem to be more just kind of dancing inside this explosion of space. Um, and spatial explosions is often how I think about Julie Maritu's work. Um, but again, in order to create something like this, inside it, I think, is hidden a lot of um, very sophisticated and very conscious experiments with spatial construction. We can always find fragments of um, different perspective systems when we look closely at Julie Maritu's work. And um, yeah, here's another work here. Again, you know, look at the lines at the top. They are helping to create the depth of the image. We've got these circles getting smaller. Um, and I'm sure if we continue to look, there'll be a lot of sort of small broken systems of space that um, help create the, the illusion that this explosion can be contained. It's not just a total random mess of marks. I think it's some really interesting stuff. Okay, so what we're going to do in, in class um, on Tuesday is we're going to look at the Panofsky text and we're going to read what Panofsky writes about why uh, perspective systems were being developed in the Italian Renaissance and why this particular type of geometry and this particular way of viewing the world
why it would arise at that time. And Panofsky makes some really interesting arguments about what was happening um, in the European Renaissance that led to this particular way of viewing the world, which has then gone on to influence all of our lives very profoundly, particularly in the um, invention of the lens, the camera, and um, the relationship to computer graphics and contemporary visual culture. So yeah, I think it'll be super interesting and hopefully it will um, help give you some ideas on how to think about space and then we'll spend some time uh, working on your individual assignments. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll see you all in class. Bye-bye.